Thanks, Aaron. Hi, everybody. As Aaron mentioned, today I'll be talking about how we use hydride generation to improve arsenic and selenium analyses in ICP OES. I'll be taking a little bit different approach than how hydride generation has been used and presented in the past, and uh, hopefully you'll learn from it. So the first question we have to address is, what is hydride generation? And basically, it's a technique for converting some elements into their gaseous form. The main benefit of hydride generation is you have increased sensitivity. The reason for this is there's no need for desalvation. When we do conventional aqueous nebulization, when the droplets enter the plasma, the plasma energy first must desalvate all the droplets. After it evaporates the water and the acid, the remaining plasma energy can then go into exciting the electrons. So we can see emission and measure the spectra. However, with hydride generation, we're putting the gaseous form of this element directly in the plasma. Therefore, there's no need for desalvation, and all the plasma energy goes into exciting the elements. And because of this, we have a higher sensitivity, and we can measure lower concentrations. Unfortunately, like everything, there's going to be some limitations. The main one is that not all elements form hydrides. And the second limitation is that different elements have different, hydro different chemistries to form the hydrides. So it means we have to do different sample preparations. Let's look at these in a little more detail. Here's a list of several elements which commonly form hydrides. In ICP OES, one of the most common requests is to for, be able to measure lower concentrations of arsenic and selenium. So that's what we'll look, look at in this work, how we improve arsenic and selenium hydride. But in addition, mercury, tin, bismuth, tellurium, and lead also form hydrides. So now let's take a look at some of the hydride chemistry reactions that are involved. First, we have to form a reactive hydride. We do this by reacting sodium borohydride with hydrochloric acid, which forms our reactive hydride in excess. This active hydride then will react with arsenic-3 and selenium-4 to form both arsenic and selenium hydride. This is what gets analyzed in the plasma. When this process occurs online, it's called continuous flow hydride generation. So with continuous flow hydride generation, the samples and reductant are mixed online as you can see here in the schematic on the right. When these mix, the metal hydrides form, and the hydrides are then separated from the aqueous component in the gas-liquid separator. And then the metal hydrides are carried away to the plasma while the excess aqueous solution is pumped to drain. And here's what the system looks like. Here's what the hydride formation system looks like in our instrument. So the two lines on the right are where the reductant and the sample come in and they're mixing the first mixing block. The hydride gas is formed and the nebulizer gas, or the carrying argon, enters in the middle and that carries the hydride into the gas liquid separator. The liquid is pumped out the bottom to the drain while the hydride is carried to the plasma. However, like everything else, hydride generation does have some limitations. First, the analytes must be in a specific oxidation state to form hydrides. For example, arsenic must be in the plus three state and selenium must be in the plus four state. Arsenic in the plus five state, it'll form hydrides a little bit, but not very efficiently. And selenium six will not form hydrides at all. So this means that the samples must undergo pre-reduction steps to ensure that their analytes are in their correct oxidation state. Because again, if they're not, they will not form hydrides. Now when we're talking about arsenic and selenium, unfortunately, these generally require different pre-reduction steps. So you see in the table below, to re get to reduce arsenic from 5 to 3, generally mix it with 0.2% potassium iodide and ascorbic acid and wait for 25 minutes. Although if you look in the literature, there are many other procedures out there which reduce arsenic 5 to arsenic 3. Likewise, to reduce selenium 6 to selenium 4, generally we add 7 molar of hydrochloric acid and heat at 90 degrees. Now unfortunately, these, these methods are not compatible with each other. For example, if we try to measure selenium hydride by mixing with ascorbic acid and potassium iodide, we don't see anything because the selenium hydride doesn't form. Likewise, if we heat the arsenic 5 up in HCl on 90 degrees C, we see very little arsenic for hydride forming. Therefore, if we want to measure arsenic and selenium in the same sample, each sample must be prepared twice, two different ways, then analyzed twice to obtain results for both arsenic and selenium. So for go the goal of this work was to explore arsenic and selenium analysis by hydride generation with a single pre-reduction procedure. 
And there are four questions we went into trying to answer. First, can it be done? Is it, if it can be done, is it practical? Will, we have, will these be compromised conditions? Maybe we won't have the optimum results for both. And can we still measure low levels? And the answer to all these questions is yes. As you'll see, yes, this can be done. Is it practical? Yeah, it's still just online analysis and it's one pre-reduction step. That's not very cumbersome. Unfortunately, yeah, it is compromised conditions. We won't have the best sensitivity that we could for arsenic, nor will we have the greatest sensitivity we could for selenium. But in either case, we're getting good, good sensitivities and we are able to measure low levels. So let's look at this in a little more detail. So first, for this work, we use arsenic-5 and selenium-6 standards exclusively. So we made sure that the standards we bought to start were certified pure arsenic-5 and certified pure selenium-6. The reason we did this is we wanted to assess the effectiveness of the pre-reduction step. Because if you have pure arsenic-5 and pure selenium-6, no hydrides will form. And this will represent the worst case scenario. Now it is possible to buy standards that are present in arsenic-3 or selenium-4. Um, some of the 1,000 ppm standards that we all use in our lab for traditional work, some come as arsenic-3, some as arsenic-5. So you really don't know what you have. Likewise, when we're analyzing real samples, we don't know what state the, the arsenic and selenium are in. So therefore, we're, we started with all our fundamental work was on arsenic-5 and selenium-6 standards. This way we know exactly that we're starting with things which will not efficiently form hydrides, or will not form hydrides at all. And we will assess the feasibility and the effectiveness of our pre-reduction procedures. The other thing we did is all our samples, calibration, standards, blanks, and spikes underwent the pre-reduction procedure. The other thing we did is since samples which come in from, for analyses of trace metals are usually preserved in 1% nitric, and in this case, we're focusing on drinking waters. And when drinking water samples are collected, usually preserved in 1% to 2% nitric acid. Therefore, what we did is we would prepare our samples and standards in 1% nitric acid, and then we'd uh, subject these to the pre-reduction procedure. Now, there are certain ways we've looked through the literature where people start out preparing things in HCl to make it easier. And yes, that will make it easier. But again, we're trying to make this practical to how people will use it in the real world. So now let's look at the sample preparation involved for the pre-reduction. First, we took equal amounts of sample or standard and combined it with an equal amount of hydrochloric acid in the 50 ml digitube. A digitube, as shown in the photo at right, is the tube which we use in our sample preparation blocks. In this case, we evaluate the procedure with two different volumes of sample. In one case, we looked at 10 ml of sample with 10 ml of HCl. In another case, we looked at 20 ml of sample with 20 ml of HCl. The reason we evaluate two different volumes was that in the real world, people may want to may look at different volumes. For example, if sample is limited, 10 ml of sample may be better. Likewise, if there's plenty of sample, but the sample may have to be analyzed several times by several different techniques, maybe it's better to use 20 ml of sample. So we looked at both, and we found that both gave equivalent results. So after we combined the sample or our standard with our HCl, we put the cap on the digitube, we shook it, put in the sample preparation block. While it still remained capped, we heated the, heat the sample to 100 degrees C for 20 minutes. Now, what I want to mention is we did this work for drinking water analysis, because that's the most common request. If there would be higher concentrations of dissolved solids, maybe higher concentrations of salts or other things in the sample, a longer heating time may be necessary to reduce all the arsenic and selenium. But for this work, we evaluated drinking water, so we heated it for 20 minutes. After the 20 minute heating time was done, we cooled the samples to room temperature, and then we diluted the final volume with deionized water. In the example where we used 10 mils of sample, we diluted to a final volume of 25 mils. And if we used 20 mils of sample, we diluted to a final volume of 50 mil. So our actual dilution on the sample is actually 2.5x. So 10 mils of sample to 25, or 20 mils of sample to 50 mils. We actually looked at what would happen if we didn't dilute the sample at the end. What if when we were done, we kept 10 mils of sample plus 10 mils of HCl, did the analysis that way? What we found is we actually got better sensitivity, could see lower levels and more consistent results when we did the final dilution with deionized water up to 25 mils. So that's what we use for the rest of this work. For our calibration standards, we made them exclusively from arsenic-5 and selenium-6 standards. 
And we did this again to make sure that we were evaluating the pre-reduction procedure because neither arsenic-5 nor, ars nor selenium-6 will efficiently form hydrides on their own. So the way we did this is we made our calibration standards at 2, 5, 10, 20 ppb and 1% nitric prior to pre-reduction. So for example, we'd make up, a, say, 50 mil volume of 2, 2 ppb arsenic-5 selenium-6, 5 ppb arsenic-5 five, five, selenium-6. We'd then take 10 mils of that standard in the 1% nitric added to our sample preparation block at 10 mils of hydrochloric acid, heat it at 100 degrees C for 20 minutes, and then dilute it to 25 mils of DI water. And we did all this work with all the measurements you see here made of external calibrations. We did all of these analyses on the AVIO 220 MAX ICP OES. The wavelengths we used were arsenic 188 and selenium 196. Now, if we look at the parameters we use, you can see they're a little bit different than stuff we would use for normal analyses. First, we use a sample uptake rate of 1.5 mils a minute. While that's not abnormal for ICP OES, we usually use a little bit lower. Another thing we use, we use an Illumina injector with the 1.2 millimeter internal diameter. The reason for this is that because we're introducing gas phase species directly to the plasma, the plasma became unstable if we're using a 2 millimeter ID injector. So by using a small, smaller ID injector, we have a more stable plasma when introducing just gas phase species. Now, if we'd want to use a two millimeter injector, we could have, but we have had to increase the plasma flow to probably 10 or 12 liters a minute. We actually did some tests with this and we found, yes, we would get better sensitivity, more stability. But the trade-off again is we're using higher, higher plasma flow. One of the things we always hear from customers is their goal is to use less argon because that's a major expense for a lab. So what we did is we optimized this to get the best sensitivity, the best stability we could with using a plasma flow of eight liters a minute. Another thing which was a little different is the way we did our readings. We did manual integration with a 10 second read time and a two second integration time. This meant we were getting five readings for every replicate with two seconds per reading. We found this actually gave us better RSDs which allowed us to read lower concentrations. Finally, the sample uptake tubing is a little bit different than what we normally use for ICP OES. We had the sample uptake tubing was actually red red. Normally we use this for a drain, but for this hydride work, we actually use that as our sample uptake tubing. We had our reductant tubing, the sodium borohydride was coming in with black black tubing. We drained it with black white tubing. Now when we did this, we told the Syngistic software that we're using red red tubing. So when we entered 1.5 mils per minute in the software, that's 1.5 mils a minute of the sample that's being taken up. Now we're also mixing that online with reductant, so we're having a combination of the black, black, and red, red mixing together. So our actual total liquid flow was actually quite a bit higher than 1.5 mils a minute, but we found this to be the most efficient. And here's what the system looks like again. So we have our reductant, which is a mixture of sodium borohydride and sodium hydroxide. It comes in, mixes with the sample, forms the hydride. We have the argon, which it mixes with. The argon carries the hydride forming species into the gas liquid separator. The, the water or the liquid is pumped out of the gas liquid separator. We just have the gas going directly to the ICP. However, one thing we did a little bit differently though, is we actually took the output of the gas liquid separator and passed it through the spray chamber, as you see in the photo at the right. This was something we, we tried, and what we found, it actually gave us better precision. So we had lower RSDs, which made the signal less noisy, and we were able to see lower levels. So we figured, and what we also noticed is that even though we have a gas phase species going through a larger volume in the spray chamber, we did not notice any washout effects or carryover effects. So it seemed to work very well. And all we did, we took the output of the line, passed it through an adapter, and to get into the spray chamber, we just cut off a five centimeter piece of Tigon tubing that we use for the nebulizer line, normal nebulizer line. So we didn't have to buy any special tubing to do anything different. And we didn't optimize the distance at the length of this tubing. We just um, took a five centimeter piece to see what would happen. That seemed to work pretty well. Okay, so let's look at some of the results here. First, we have to make sure we get a calibration curve because if we can't get calibrations, then the results don't really mean anything. What we find here, if you look at the calibration curve on the left for arsenic and on the right for selenium, we looked, had standards that were 2, 5, 10, and 20 ppb. Again, these are the, 
These are the concentration of the standards that we made in 1% nitric. These were then going, went through the reduction procedure, so they're actually being diluted 2.5 times more. So the actual concentration of the arsenic and selenium going in is 0.8 ppb for the 2 ppb standard. And what we could see if we look at the combination, our regressions are all 0.999, which is good. We'll see that our residual errors, they're all less than 4%. So there's, a, so there's a true evaluation of how good the curve is. Regressions are a good, good starting point. We also need to look at the error in each standard to know what's going on. And so we see that these curves are very good. We uh, pretty, get, pretty much get these anytime we wanted. So we know that we could see low levels pretty consistently. So the next thing we want to make sure is we have accuracy. Once we establish the calibration curve, we want to make sure we can do accurate analyses. So we took trace metals in drinking water B, which is a certified reference material that contains arsenic at 10 ppb and selenium at 11 ppb. We prepared the sample and then we analyzed it four times in a row. And what we can see that for arsenic and selenium, in all cases, our results, our recovery is within 10%. So again, this shows we're accurate. And again, this shows the results of four trials. We've done this over several days to make sure we can do it. And yeah, it was accurate and reproducible. After establishing the accuracy with the reference material, we want to see how low we could actually measure. Again, the reference material was at 10 ppb. So after 2.5x dilution, that's about 4 ppb for arsenic and about 4.4 ppb for selenium going to the plasma. So we wanted to evaluate if we can measure lower concentrations in a drinking water matrix. So what we did is we took some tap water, collected in our lab, then we spiked it with 1, 2, 5, 10 ppb of arsenic and selenium, preserved in 1% nitric, then took 10 or 20 mils of the tap water sample and subjected to the pre-reduction procedure. And what we could see is if we go down to 1 ppb arsenic, we could recover between 90 and 100%. For selenium, we could only go down to 2 ppb. Our 1 ppb selenium, we cannot get accurate recoveries within 10%. So what we can say is with this simultaneous uh, pre-reduction procedure, we could accur accurately read down to 1 ppb for arsenic and 2 ppb for selenium. As we show here, we recovered the 10 ppb spikes just as well as we did with the 10 ppb in the certified reference material. So accounting for dilution, the, the lowest concentrations we could accurately read going to the plasma are 0.4 ppb for arsenic and 0.8 ppb for selenium. So that's all good. Now we want to see how well, how stable the analyses are. So we took our tap water sample, spiked it with 10 ppb arsenic and selenium, and measured it 15 times. And as you can see, our recoveries are all right around 100%. So it shows we have very stable recoveries. With the accuracy and the stability established, we next looked at detection limits. The way we did this is we took a 1% nitric acid blank and carried it through the same sample preparation and pre-reduction procedures, and then measured detection limits as determined by three times the standard deviation of 10 replicates. So we can see in the orange bars on this plot, the detection limits are all less than 0.5 ppb, which is well below the limits defined in various countries, which are represented by the blue, plot, blue bars. So as you can see, arsenic limits are generally 10 ppb globally with the exception of Mexico, where it's up about 20. And selenium varies a little bit more between 10 and 50 ppb in different areas around the world. This actually shows why we did our stability measurements also at 10 ppb, because this represented the lowest levels which are, accept which are required in different countries globally. OK, so we've shown that we can do arsenic and selenium by hydride generation using a single pre-reduction step. This makes analyses more efficient in that we only have to analyze a sample once if we want to do arsenic and selenium by hydride. But there, this also causes a problem, though. What if we want to do multiple elements, some hydride elements, some non-hydride elements? We still could do arsenic and selenium at one time, but then we'd have to switch over the sample introduction system to manage the other analytes by conventional aqueous nebulization. So to alleviate this problem, there's been development of sample introduction systems which can do simultaneous hydride and aqueous at the same time. And basically this involves splitting the sample flow where the sample is aspirated through the nebulizer and the hydride is, comes in through another port on the spray chamber. So this is great, 
But again, if we want to do multiple species by multiple analytes by hydride generation, we need to have a procedure which we could pre-reduce the analytes, the hydride forming analytes in one step. Otherwise, some of the uh, benefits of this simultaneous work is lost. So for example, if we want to look at arsenic and selenium by hydride generation at the same, with one of these new spray chambers, at the same time we're looking at other analytes by conventional nebulization, if we use the ascorbic acid potassium iodide sample preparation, which would give you the, the best signal for arsenic, but not enhance um, selenium, we then lose a lot of the benefit of this um, simultaneous sample introduction system. So it's really important that we find pre-reduction procedures that can handle multiple analytes. Again, in this work, we focused on arsenic and selenium, but we certainly can extend this out to look at some of the other elements I showed earlier, such as mercury, tin, bismuth, tellurium. So when we use these um, sample introduction systems that have both hydride and aqueous at the same time, it's also important to know how much is coming from your hydride, how much is coming from the nebulization. Because even though we're enhancing sensitivity with the hydride, we're still getting some sensitivity from the aqueous nebulization also. So it's, what we're seeing is actually a combination of both. So one of the sample introduction systems out there is the hydromist, which allows us to do simultaneous aqueous and hydride at the same time. So basically what happens is the is sample goes through a T and is divided. Some of the sample goes to conventional nebulizer, where it's just pumped in the spray chamber. On the other side of the spray chamber, we have the hydride coming in. So the other part of the sample is mixed online with the sodium borohydride to reduce it. We have a sample coming into the spray chamber this way. In this case, the spray chamber is, is functioning as the gas liquid separator. And then we have the output going to the plasma and we have excess going to drain. So we have a schematic of how this pumps. We see that our sample is taken up, it's divided, Half of it goes directly to a nebulizer in the spray chamber. The other half is mixed with reductant on the other side of the spray chamber when it enters the spray chamber. Then we have the drain is being pumped. So this, this allows us to do simultaneous hydride and aqueous sample introduction. And here, the spray chamber is functioning as our gas liquid separator. What this means is we have our reductant, which is usually sodium borohydride entering the spray chamber. What this means also is that the sodium and the boron backgrounds will be very, very high. So one of the limitations of this technique, in addition to its complexity, is that we're going to have very high sodium and boron backgrounds, which means we won't be able to analyze sodium and boron at all at any meaningful levels. Now, in environmental analysis and drinking water analysis, is this a big deal? Uh, for boron, probably not. In most places, but some places it may be. And sodium, if people want to analyze the minerals, well, we're not going to be able to get all the minerals then, get meaningful results. But nevertheless, it's an interesting concept. So we have some initial data from some of the work we've done. I'll give credit, some of the, this work was done by some of our um, field application scientists uh, who did this work, so I'm just presenting for them. So basically, some of these, these studies were done on both the Avio 220 and 550 max ICP OESs. And in this case, if we look at the system, we're using a C-spray nebulizer, and this gives us actually very good sensitivity, produce a very fine aerosol. As before, even though we're using the hydromous spray chamber, we're still using the Illumina injector, 1.2 millimeter ID injector. Our sample uptake rate is three mils a minute. Before, we were using just 1.5 mils a minute, and the reason is that we're splitting the flow. Half the flow is going to the sample, is going to, the, sorry, the hydride, the other half of the sample is going to the nebulizer, so about 1.5 mils an inch each side, again, which is very similar to what we did before. Because we have the extra flow going into, this, into the spray chamber and ultimately into the plasma, we increase the plasma flow to 10 liters a minute. This provides us with more state, more stability. And the rest of the uh, parameters are more or less uh, normal. So here, let's take a look at some initial results. So if we look at conventional nebulization of 50 ppb standards, we see that they're relatively low signals. But if we use the hydromist and use it 5 ppb, we're seeing we're much higher sensitivity. So we're actually seeing that we're having enhanced sensitivity with hydride. And again, to see this, as we mentioned before, this requires a pre-reduction of arsenic and selenium. 
So you see how the first part of the talk is the fundamental work, and now we're seeing how it could be applied to when we're trying to do things a little bit more complex. So here's some calibration curves where we looked at arsenic and selenium. They were being made by hydride, and the manganese was being looked at by just conventional nebulization. So to check for linearity, what we did, we ran low-level calibrations, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10 ppb for each. And see, we could see, if we look at the spectra above the blank, we see our 2 ppb standard clearly for both the arsenic and selenium, as well as the manganese. And we see that our curves are very linear. So this is showing that we can get enhanced sensitivity for arsenic and selenium, just like we did before, but at the same time, while we're getting good sensitivity for manganese. So here we looked at repeatability, where we're looking at both hydride and non-hydride elements. In this case, we took a 50 ppb standard, which we we're measuring over 50 minutes. In this case, we had a bunch of hydride elements we we're looking at. We're looking at arsenic at two different wavelengths, at three different wavelengths, selenium at two different wavelengths. And we threw a little tin in there also to see what would happen. And we see that they're all stable around 50 ppb. We see nothing less than 48 ppb, nothing greater than 52 ppb. And likewise, if we look at elements which don't form hydrides, we looked at a variety of them. Again, they're all plus minus 2 ppb also over the course of 50 minutes. Again, these are just standards, but again, it's our initial work that shows that the system looks like it's working pretty well. The next step was to evaluate the accuracy of the methodology using the Hydromist sample introduction system. To do this, we measured a trace elements in river water reference material from the Japan Society of Analytical Chemistry and looked at the 10 certified analytes. In these cases, arsenic and selenium are our hydride forming elements, while the other analytes do not form hydride. What you can see for the most part, our analytes recovered within their plus minus 10%, demonstrating good accuracy. The exception was copper, which recovered a little bit on the high side. Um, we have to go back and try to figure out why this happened, repeat the test. But from our initial set of data, for our initial look, it looks very promising. The concentrations you see above the bar are the certified concentrations of each element in this reference material. So if we take a summary of hydride generation, what we see is hydride generation allows for enhanced sensitivity, meaning that lower levels can be measured. We've seen that a single pre-reduction step can be used for both arsenic and selenium, which allows measurements down to 1 ppb for arsenic and 2 ppb for selenium. We've seen that when we use a hydromist simultaneous hydride aqueous sample reduction system, we see enhanced sensitivity of the hydride elements, very similar to what we saw when doing the hydride analysis by itself. And we see that we get accurate stable analyses for hydride and non-hydride elements. So our future work will look at trying to develop simultaneous pre-reduction steps for multiple hydride elements, adding on more in addition to arsenic and selenium. We'll also evaluate the hydromist further, see if we when we get better results, understand a little better, so we can optimize the conditions for it. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and your attention. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ken. That was uh, great. I, I mean, I, I, I used to do a lot of hydride generation in, in the past. So brings back uh, uh, a lot of those <laughs> memories. Um, okay, so Ken, you ready for some questions? Sure, I'll give it my best shot. All righty. Um, let me see here. So the first question, uh, can we do this for hydrocarbon samples? I think that that's going to be a little difficult because we have to break down the hydrocarbon first. The reason is that for the pre-reduction requires a mixing in with the hydrochloric acid and aqueous samples. And if the hydrocarbon sample will, is not miscible with the hydrochloric acid, we're not going to get the pre-reduction to work. So I would think we'd have to do um, some digestion first of the hydrocarbon sample to break that down so it's in its aqueous form. And once that happens, then we can do the pre-digestion or the uh, pre-reduction. Um, we'd have to act, try it to see if it would work just with adding the HCl to it and doing that. I don't think it would, but it would have to be tried. Yeah, that's that's 
my thoughts as well. I, I'm looking at that question. Um, I, I would say, and I've done oils before in the past where, where I, I had to essentially do a hydride to hit some of the detection limits. And, um, and I, the first thing is you digest them. So completely, you know, remove the, the organic matrix as much as possible into an aqueous phase. And then you'd need to reduce, pre-reduce, you know, your elements because and usually in normal digestion, it'll be oxidized and converted to arsenic five and insulin name six. So then you pre-reduce and bring them back to the, the reduced form, uh, lower oxidization state, and then do the hydride analysis. So yeah, you, it's possible. It's just uh, for the chemistry to work, it needs to be aqueous really. Um, and then uh, I had another question here, Ken. Um, our synergistic software doesn't have residual error reported. How do we get that? Uh, I guess not a hydride question, but it's more of a software question there, Ken. Um, and that's really their, their version, right? The version yeah, that's of the version that of synergistics they have. The current shipping version of Synergistics is 5.1, and that does automatically do, includes the residual um, of the calibration standard, the residual error. Yeah, yeah. Actually, it's really nice. But, you know, we, we, we've added that in the report, uh, uh, in the calibration report as well. So um, it's a nice thing to review. I, I actually sometimes prefer residual error versus, uh, versus the correlation coefficient. Co you know, you can make anything correlate. <laughs> Uh, if you try hard enough, <laughs> but uh, but residual error does provide greater insight. Um, next question. I'm not totally sure the source of this question. Um, uh, someone asked about eliminating acidic interferences such as nitric and HF. Um, really, I mean the acid is necessary to do these microwave digestions uh, in these complex matrices that you indicate, like soils and food. Um, it's not really an interference, it's a necessity. Um, and when we did, did the did this work, we prepared all the samples in nitric acid first before doing the pre-reduction. Yeah. So again, so we, I, didn't, we, yeah. Didn't, I, we didn't, I look at, you know, 10% nitric or anything like that. That wasn't our goal, but we'd have to evaluate to see if that would yeah. cause an effect. So Jimmy, I mean, if you're having, you know, method problems, you might want to reach out to me or Ken, and we can look at the what you're trying to achieve uh, or what you're doing and what you're trying to achieve a little bit more. Normally, in those matrices, we don't use HF. I mean, just for the fact that, you know, we're not trying to dissolve all the silicates in there. They're usually negligible amounts anyway. There is a um, procedure that, that's using microwave digestion. It's a post-digestion procedure or secondary digestion, which will convert the HF into a different form, so it will not attack cool. glass. But I mean, we need, yeah, we need to look at uh, yeah. what what's happening. The whole the whole story. Exactly. Um, we had a question: Is the software used for uh, different from just your normal software? Is there any? I, I guess the question is: Was there anything special about the software? From our normal software, and the answer should be no, right, Ken? Yeah, no, I use just regular Synergistics. I have 5.1 on my instrument, do, didn't do anything special. I set up everything just like I would be doing a normal, normal aqueous analysis. The only difference was the way I was introducing the sample. Yeah, yeah, so it's, it's standard software, just slightly different usage. Um, um, good question here. Um, from Cynthia, any problems with selenium in high sodium chloride samples like 1% sodium chloride? I don't know because I didn't evaluate that. Um, that's a good question though. And that would be yeah. something we'd have to look at. Again, a lot of this work at this point was fundamental, trying to keep the matrix simple so we understood the pre-reduction, but that's actually a good thing we should look at at some point is how does how do the sample matrix interfere with it? So if we were to so, do 1% sodium chloride, what would we have to do to get the pre-reduction? We would have to do it longer, use more acid, you know, things like yeah, that. Yeah, sodium chloride, my experience isn't wasn't a big deal. Um, it, it was other um, first row transition elements that usually affect the reductions. So um, depending on the amount of first row transition, like 
a big one, zinc, for example. Mm. Yeah. It it causes problems with the reduction. So typically I use a chelating agent like EDTA or something like that to to bring uh, those those metal, you know, to to bind those metals, to chelate those metals. And so they don't they cause less of an issue with the reduction steps. Um, but yeah, that wasn't really presented here. Um, but yeah. And sodium chloride, I, I haven't had too many problems with in the past. It's been a while. Um, and I'll say this is my first. This is my first exam first time ever doing hydride generation. So I was trying to take it basic first to understand basically. So I did everything one at a time. I started evaluating things, trying to do both elements at the same time. And, you know, with more time, you certainly add on more more matrix effects and look at those. Mm -hmm. Yep. And do the matrix recovery like you were doing, right? Do the evaluation. Exactly. Yep. Um, any analysis with, so, oh, this is an interesting question. I, I haven't actually done well. Any analysis with the Teflon spray chamber for boron and sodium background? Um, um, no, we did not no. do that. One of the issues with, we have to worry about the Teflon spray chamber is they tend to accumulate charge and can cause uh, signal drift. Um, there are different there are different versions of these out there, and there are different ways to get around that. Um, some of them involve grounding the spray chamber, but of Teflon. One of the issues with Teflon is that when aerosols are generated, they form charge, and the charge tends to stick to Teflon, so you can't see sample drift. Yeah, I mean, now, I avoid Teflon as much as I can. Yeah. Um, so you know, I mean, I, this would be interesting because we're actually forming the gas before the spray chamber. So it's interesting to know if we'd still see that effect. It, it, it shouldn't, right? It shouldn't, it's yeah. Just the hydrides being introduced. If there's a yeah. liquid as well, like a simultaneous introduction, um, you, and you have hydrofluoric acid, yeah, I mean, you'd, you'd want to problem. probably not use a borosilicate, um, you know, uh, in that case, that you'll get some boron. And again, in ICP OES levels, it depends on, on how low you're going. And mass spec would definitely, uh, you know, want to avoid the glass or, or quartz. Um, a little bit of HF just strips a little bit of silica. So silica, you know, if you're not interested in silica, silicon, <laughs> uh, <laughs> not a big deal, my experience. And that's guess, actually the way depends. I clean my glass spray chamber sometimes is I'll aspirate half percent HF for about a minute. Yeah, actually HF does an amazing job of cleaning those chambers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so again, depends on a bunch of parameters. So it'd be nice to understand your application a little bit more. Feel free to reach out. Um, and there's another question. Again, it might be tough without understanding the, the nature of the sample. Sometimes when we run the sample, some brown precipitation form, and we can't get a reading. Um, you, I mean, in my experience, again, I, again, I need to know what's happening. If that's still like a lot of hydrocarbons in there, if you haven't done a full digestion of the sample, there could be something um, reducing from the high, reducing potential of the reductant being used. Um, um, but, uh yeah it really kind of depends it could be it could be anything you do definitely need more context to try yeah. to address that um and uh yeah oh yeah just thinking about that boron and sodium again i mean yeah that that will happen uh, if you're introducing the the borohydride right the reductant but in this case when you set up a liquid introduction and it in a hydride introduction, that boron and sodium should be mostly left behind in the in the liquid phase, as the, as it separated out from the gas. Um, I, I probably should have said that. Um, um, so someone had a question on fat oils and vegetable oils. Um, so. They asked if uh, should have any additional steps. Uh, again, um, yeah, I mean, you digest carefully uh, in 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 a, some of some sort of digestion system. Usually, a microwave um, is the best because it, you know you don't lose your volatiles. Um, you can do a pre-digestion, you know, with a, or cold digestion in the in the vessel as well. It's always good for highly carbonaceous samples. Um, I usually use a little bit of peroxide to help uh, the nitric oxidize the carbon off as CO2. 
Um, yeah. Uh, any other tips there, Ken? Yeah, I would say if you're doing anything like that, that complex, um, got to break it down first in the microwave. Just to get it down to an to basically an aqueous sample that we could deal with by for the pre-reduction for the hydride. Yeah, exactly. Uh, someone asked, these are all well, all we're all done with OES. Are there any plans to look at MS? Uh, we haven't looked at mass spec yet. I did this work on OES, and my um, colleagues in the field who did this, they all did it on OES. And it, I guess the main reason is we get a lot, a lot of requests in OES. Can we hit lower levels of arsenic and selenium? Correct. So that's what that's, we focused it on there. That's that's the main exactly reason. it. Uh, so I guess just for some context to why this focus on OES is because it's what Ken said. Most people go, oh, you know, I don't have an ICP MS, but I want to get lower detection for these particular elements with my OES that I already own, um, how can we do that, right? And so this is a way to do that with without buying an ICPMS, really. Um, but yeah, you can actually hit these detections with ICPMS, but you can also do hydride generation with ICPMS, just like Ken showed. It's actually the same. There's, there's no difference. I've done a ton of it, again, in a lot distant past. But uh, it's the same. You generate a hydride. You can use AA, ICP, ICP, MS, OES, or MS. It doesn't uh, matter. They all detect the elements. It's, it's hydride's just a method of introducing the analyte. Um, yeah, it's uh, and uh, this another one said. You know, is this was with all of you? Would it be possible with other models of OES? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then. Somebody asked AA FIM, so okay, AA versus OES. Which is better? Do you which one do you prefer? <laughs> Again, it depends on what you have. It depends on what types of samples you're doing. What, how many samples you have. Um, I've done a lot more ICP OES in my life than AA, so I feel more comfortable with OES. So for me, that would be easier. Um, I haven't but, done a lot of flame AA, but that's. But the, but the big one, Ken, you nailed it to me is how many samples do you have? So right. sometimes dedicating an ICP just to hydride doesn't make sense. And it would be better to have an AA exactly. hydride system that's dedicated, cheaper running costs as well. But if you have the occasional need to do lower levels of arsenic and selenium, for example, or mercury, you can do it with OES by introducing the vapor or hydride. Um, I prefer a dedicated system if I'm going to do it with, you know, all day long, every day, uh, but, uh, or, or maybe even look at ICP MS, uh, you know, depending on the situation. Um, and, but, um, but OES, you know, will give you other you know, elements as well, right? It's molecule, multi-element technique. And then uh, that kind of actually leads to, can you do multi-element analysis with hydride? Um, you, there is, there are ways to do simultaneous. So you can, as I said, introduce the liquid sample and the hydride gas uh, at the same time. Uh, so it is possible to to do multi-element. Uh, and like we showed, we did arsenic and selenium at the same time. So technically, it's multi-element. It's only two, yeah. but it's multi. And you combine you that with uh, liquid gas, yeah. liquid as well, at the same time, yeah. and combine it with the gas. Yeah. And that was the last part of the presentation talking about that. Yeah. And that's a multi-element analysis. Yep. Yeah. Um, no, those are really good questions, though. Um, yeah, no. Uh, again, it, there are quite a few variables, as Ken said, your matrix, number of samples, your you know hardware available to you, your budgets, stuff like that. Um, you know, so so if if you have a particular scenario or situation, you know, feel free to reach out. I can help uh, advise you on what's kind of the, sounds like the best for your scenario. So uh, I don't see any more questions there, Ken. Um, so if you know anyone has any questions, feel free to reach out as I said, and to locate the uh, all the recordings and other webinars in the Atomic Spectroscopy webinar series, please visit uh, this link. Anyone that's already registered or is on my mailing list will, you know, will get this link anyway and already knows this. 
uh, page where these exist. So again, thank you, Ken. That was a great uh, presentation. It's you know somewhat unique, and uh, thank everybody for attending today's webinar. Again, if you have any questions, please reach out. Uh, once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation, and we would appreciate it if you can complete that and provide your feedback. You also receive a follow-up email within 24 hours with a link to view this recording of today's webinar. So on behalf of Park Nelmer and our presenter, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day, week. Take care, be safe.